All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hamara Osman, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada and the Canadian Association for Pompeii, I welcome you to today's webinar. We're really grateful that we have some excellent panelists today to talk about their experiences emerging from the pandemic. It's an exciting talk compared to the ones that we've had in the past year, talking about um, you know, the impact of COVID-19. I wanted to pass it over to Brad, but before I do so, I wanted to share that we have two webinars in July. On July 6th, we have a webinar for clinicians, academics, and researchers. This is an ECME webinar on Pompeii. And then on Friday, July 9th, we have a webinar for patients, family members, allied healthcare professionals, and we can send out that information following this webinar. So we hope to see you at those sessions as well. Over to you, Brad. Thanks, Amira. Uh, we're really pleased to partner with Muscular Dystrophy Canada on this webinar and welcome some great speakers. Uh, my name is Brad Crittenden. I'm Executive Director for the Canadian Association of Pompeii. You would be forgiven if you had never heard of Pompeii disease before. It's rare. It's a rare genetic disorder. There are only 60 diagnosed patients in Canada, so that's across the whole country, which is not very many. One of the things that Pompeii does is cause, cause muscle weakness including the breathing muscles. So that in combination with a respiratory virus doesn't sound like a good thing, right? Which of course it isn't. Um, I want to just really briefly tell you just a, a, a little bit about myself, about, let's see, this would be February of last year. So, so not this last February, but the one before that, I was in Florida. And after that, we were going to go to New Orleans to do some, some tourist um, activities in New Orleans. We were planning to have a really good time. That fell through, we didn't go. But that ended up actually being the time when there was quite an outbreak there. And if we had gone, we would have been there with all the other tourists, elbow to elbow, um, in you know small rooms, listening to music, and it probably would not have been a good thing. So disappointed not to go, but pretty thankful that we didn't because um, there's a pretty good chance that, that you know, we may have, have, have picked up the virus and then brought it home to our family and friends. Obviously not good, right? So today, we're going to um, kind of divide this up into three parts. First, we're going to hear from three members of our, our Pompeii community. So two adults living with Pompeii disease and one parent of a, a child living with Pompeii disease. So they're going to kind of recap what it's been like for them the last year and looking forward. And we're really fortunate to be joined by Dr. Anil Khan. Uh, Dr. Khan has, has spoken um, to us before. I think, he, in fact, he did a year ago about, about COVID. So, so he's going to be back with us. And then we'll pull everybody together for a roundtable discussion. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. I have a feeling that we'll, we'll run out of time, but we'll, we'll do our very best. So I'd like to introduce Alexandra Butler. Um, after being diagnosed at the age of 23 with, with Pompeii, Alex completed her Bachelor of Education and she's now teaching and doing her master's um, and living in, in Nova Scotia. So I don't know how she does all of it, but, uh, but she does. So Alex is going to moderate today. So lucky you, you don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, Alex is going to look after you. But before you get into everything else, Alex, can you please uh, take a few minutes, tell us what it's been like for you through all of this, because you're, you're a teacher, you're going to school, um, you, you're a young person, so I'm sure you'd rather be out with your friends, and um, like we all would be, um, and, and, and living with, with a, a, a disease called Pompeii. So if you could do that, that would be great. And thanks for moderating. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Brad. Uh, so my name is Alexandra Butler, and like Brad said, I am a Pompeii patient, and I am from Nova Scotia. So I have to put the disclaimer in, I feel as though I am super lucky Nova Scotians have had a very different experience with COVID than many other places um, have experienced. So for instance, our highest cases in one day was 227 on the 21st of April. That was kind of in our third wave. But today we're back to having um, zero new cases. So that's pretty awesome. And we only have 60 active cases 
in our province right now, which are mostly located in our central zone, which is Halifax. So that's our big city. So for me, with COVID as a teacher, it was definitely really nerve wracking. Um, being in a school with so many people in tight spaces, um, you know, really kind of gives you a bit of anxiety because you can't escape as much as we would love to say that we were able to have that six foot distance between people. That wasn't always the case. And being a resource teacher, that meant that I wasn't just with my classroom. That meant that I was in lots of classrooms every day. So I saw a very large caseload um, compared to what some other classroom teachers might have had. So that was definitely something that weighed on the back of my mind, especially as cases started to crop up in schools here. We were very fortunate and at my school, we didn't end up having an active case, but there was one um, in the school next to us. So a few of our staff members had actually had to self-isolate because of being a close contact. Um, so especially when it got close, that's when it really kind of hit a little bit harder with the what ifs and what abouts, like you said, Pompeii having um, an impact on respiratory function and this being a disease or a flu, I suppose, that can greatly impact that. There were a lot of, um, a lot of little questions that kind of played in the back of my mind. Uh, I too really took advantage of the online shopping um, and the curbside pickup. So <laughs> my credit card might not have liked that, uh, but it was really great to have kind of those options. My partner also did a lot of our local shopping and the errands. Um, but right now I'm really happy to say that things in Nova Scotia are looking pretty good and slowly but surely I'm feeling a little bit more confident about reintegrating into those kind of more normal society type functions. So seeing friends outdoors, socially distanced, those are some things that I'm really looking forward to this summer. So I'm going to pass this on to Sherry. Sherry Simo is with us tonight and she is a nurse and a mother of two boys, one who is age four and is affected by Pompeii disease. Take it away, Sherry. Thanks so much, Alexandra. And I live in Ontario. We haven't been able to get a haircut since September, so I'm very jealous. <laughs> Apparently only three more weeks and there's hope. Um, so I really struggled when I sat down to talk about what it was like because I'm not the patient, I'm the parent. And to be a pandemic parent um, to a child with a rare disease was both a shared and a unique experience. Uh, but I really felt like everything ended up falling into one of three categories, um, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I thought of Clint Eastwood, and he had it much easier in the Wild West. He could hug the people that he loved. He only had to wear masks when it was dusty, and his standoffs did not involve arrows in grocery store lines. So I, I think we've been through enough this year. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to actually try to show you guys um, what the pandemic's been like for us. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. If it doesn't work, please let me know. All right, can everyone see that? We sure can. Wonderful. That is our Liam. So he is four and has Pompeii. Uh, so I wanted to start with the bad. And I think the bad are things that were shared between most parents. Um, we had no school and no daycare for months on end um, and ended up having to juggle work, be teachers, be best friends, host birthday parties, also be the guest and the entertainers at the same birthday parties. Um, and we lost a lot of the relief and the resources that we had gotten set up and had come to count on to be able to coordinate all of the different needs that Liam has. Um, I know through some of this, our children at points really felt like they were being ignored and weren't getting the attention that they needed. Um, this is dinner that Liam made when I was on a conference call just a little too long. <laughs> this was one of many different episodes, but I think this picture will always be one of my favorites. Um, 
some of the other struggles were having to modify resources to being online. And we tried Zoom physiotherapy. As you can see from Liam's face, he was not a fan. Uh, we were really thrilled to be able to get back into the services, but we did end up having to do all of his services online for about six months throughout the pandemic with both the OT and the PT and all of the other different support staff. We had to figure out how to make a mask for a three-year-old who constantly drools because of reduced muscle weakness in his jaw. I promise this was not the final product, but we had a chance to get very creative and it took a lot of coordinating to help make him safe so that we felt like he could go out in public. The ugly was what it did to our family. Um, the fear that my husband and I, and even our oldest son lived with that we could bring this home and the impact that it would have on Liam's future health. We've been in hospitals before, um, the pandemic and Liam's been on oxygen therapy and had other respiratory issues. So we had a pretty good understanding of what those risks were. And for both my husband and I, we had to work outside of the house. And um, in my role, I was actually exposed to COVID on a regular basis. And in, in such a panic about bringing it home, especially in the beginning when we didn't know how it was transmitted. I recall you know, having my routine when I got in the door of disrobing in the garage, change, disinfecting head to toe, cleaning into, switching into new clothes, bagging everything for 14 days that I'd worn, spraying my shoes. There may have been an incident where I forgot to close the garage door. So on a positive note, we can't have block parties. So I don't know whether or not I actually flashed my neighbors and I'm hoping we can move past that. Um, I think for us, the very hardest part of this was when my husband was identified as a contact of a contact. And even though public health didn't identify that he needed to isolate, the risk to us was so great um, that my husband actually moved out of the house for days or weeks. Uh, we weren't sure until we were clear that he was going to be completely safe to return home. And it's the longest him and the boys have ever been apart from each other. The other thing was the sacrifice of our families. Um, I have a big family, lots of siblings, lots of nieces and nephews, and without blinking an eye, my entire family agreed that my parents would be there to support us so that Liam could get all of his care needs met and that we could still coordinate all of his, his requirements. Um, so they sacrificed seeing their elderly parents, their grandkids, my siblings for a really long duration to be there for us. And uh, that is a sacrifice that I will always be grateful for. Um, but there was a lot of good that came out of the pandemic. Uh, we got to switch from hospital infusions to home care. And while this may not be the right fit for everybody, it was a real gift for us. And we were gifted with a home care nurse who I swear is my very own Mary Poppins. Um, this was the healthiest year we have ever had because of all of the different measures and procedures, it is the first time we've gone 12 months without either child getting a respiratory infection at all, which was a lovely reprieve. In addition, um, medicine learned to get creative and embrace technology. Um, the gift of being able to just call a physician to get a prescription renewed over the phone versus having to take half a day off of work. Um, you know, and being able to spend that time with your family instead was wonderful. Um, you know, I, I really am leaving this pandemic with, with a lot of hope and a lot of optimism, feeling like we are finally starting to get to the tail end of this. So that's kind of been our last year. Um, uh, lots of ups and downs. Um, oh, there we go. Lots of ups and downs. Found the humor through most of it, um, even though some days were really rough. But, uh, you know, as I went through this, there was a lot of future learnings that I really hope that we as a society grab onto. And the biggest for me is one, it's okay to not be okay. And it's wonderful to hear people talking about that. And two is what happens when the scientific community and the commu global community as a whole actually works together to solve a problem. And 
how quickly we were able to talk about cures, to talk about vaccines, to talk about what was working, what was not working, how many studies could be run. And if we could harness power of that nature, what hope that actually means for people with rare diseases moving forward. So yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you so much for sharing, Sherry. And I loved those photos. Those are okay. awesome. And you're right. He definitely did not look very impressed on that trampoline. <laughs> oh, he was so mad that day. <laughs> no, that did not look like his top 10 uh, choice of preferred activities for sure. So next up, we have Lachlan Smith. And Lachlan is affected by Pompeii himself. He's a chef with a young family living on the BC coast. Beautiful BC. Lachlan, take it away. Hi, well, my name's Lachlan Smythe. Um, I've, uh, well, I've had Pompeii all my life, but I was diagnosed with it uh, about four years ago or so. Um, I'm kind of in the middle of the other two presenters. My, my wife is a learning services teacher who works at a high school, and I have two young children of my own. Um, so uh, the experience of Pompeii for me, um, or sorry, of uh, the pandemic for me with Pompeii was one of uh, being in the house a lot. Um, we were, we were told, um, by the specialists in Vancouver that there was a virtual certainty of life-threatening complications was the, uh, uplifting language they used, um, were I to contract COVID. So I, uh, I took, uh, the first four months of the pandemic off of work, um, cause I work in a kitchen, obviously I can't, uh, that's not something I can do remotely. Um, so, uh, sorry, my cat's meowing in the background. <laughs> Um, so I wasn't, uh, wasn't able to go to work. Um, thank goodness for the CERB that made a big difference, but, uh, you know, the, the major impacts on my family, um, a lot of stress for my wife. I mean, she, uh, she does the same thing Alexandra does, you know, working with lots of different classrooms. Um, I live in a pretty small town. Um, there's about 12 and a half thousand people here. So it was only the one high school. So, you know, basically she was a contact of the whole town. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that put a lot of stress on her, um, put a lot of stress on my children, um, knowing that, uh, you know, every day going to school could mean that they would bring back a disease that could kill their dad, um, really weighed heavily on my seven-year-old a lot. Um, she's a pretty conscientious kid, so that was, that was difficult. Um, I spent a good month and a half um, actually living down in the spare room in the basement, um, isolating from my own family and my own children. Um, so it was, it was really tough to not be able to, you know, not be able to hug your kids, um, not be able to come upstairs and play with them and make them dinner and all that kind of thing. That was, uh, that was difficult. Um, and yeah, that was, that was probably the worst of it. I'd say the best parts, um, just getting to spend so much more time with them. I mean, being home from work, um, for four months at the beginning there, it was, I mean, that's, that's a gift that not a lot of parents get to have um, that much time with their young children. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's about it for me, really. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm hopeful, though, um, I'm really excited about the potentials of the mRNA vax or the mRNA technology in treating Pompeii. Um, I know that they've just started um, doing clinic, human clinical trials for gene therapy treatments using it. And I'm thinking that uh, the, the, the focus of the scientific and medical communities on the potential of mRNA because of the attention it's gotten um, being the main, being the driving force behind the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is really going to help jumpstart uh, research into using that to cure our disease, which would be great. <laughs> Definitely something to be hopeful for. And you're right. It's very, very exciting research. Thank you so much for sharing. So next, we are actually going to talk with Dr. Anil Khan. And Dr. Anil Khan is a medical geneticist and pediatrician in Calgary who has over 16 years of experience diagnosing and treating rare disease. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm on my cell phone. My desktop is deciding to um, uh, uh, sleep or do something, and I'm going to try to get the video on. And it's saying unable to access camera. So I sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. So 
I apologize. I will try to continue to work to get my desktop to come online and maybe you'll see my video. But in the meantime, I think we can just start. And I think um, it is wonderful to hear the stories. I know it joined a little late because of technical issues, but um, uh, I think there was a question deck that uh, I got earlier. And depending on what people want to do, we can start with the question deck because those actually had some nice questions. And, um, but whatever people would like. Is that, is that okay? It, it's I, totally I, up to you, whatever, whatever you would like to do. Sure. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind displaying that question deck. Uh, I can too. Um, I think my computer finally rebooted, so it might do something good now. But um, I can go to it in, let's try to multitask here in my email as well. Where did that go? You would think we had all this stuff working after all this, but um, we still have technical challenges. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna see share content. It says. If you'd like Dr. Khan, I'd be happy to, po to pose oh, the first question you. for you. Thank you. Um, not a problem. So one of the first questions we had was with respect to younger children and the delay in being able to actually vaccinate young children uh, because of the lack of research. We don't know whether or not they'll ever be vaccinated. Um, how do we balance the risk of Pompe disease for younger kids than we do for other individuals because of the vaccination issues? So the data issue in Pompe disease and in COVID in general in pediatrics versus results is adults is not new. I, there's a lot of things we do in pediatrics for which there actually have been few studies and nothing comparable in adults. So now there have been studies in pediatric patients with the vaccine. One could also argue uh, that there have been no studies in Pompe disease and sort of how far does one go before they have enough data. But the vaccines by and large are safe. They've been tested in a massive amount of people. If you consider an ERT or a gene therapy, it will never have the distribution that these vaccines have had. And yes, there have been some complications, but I think we also have to recognize that nothing comes without risk. And that includes doing nothing. So if I can, uh, eventually get this stuff to work and display a, a graph that shows the relative risk of um, COVID versus Pompeii versus, um, 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 let's say if we look at blood clots, so the, the blood clot risk from getting COVID is 12%. The risk from the AstraZeneca vaccine was 0.0004%. So I think, yes, we see in stories, the complications highlighted. But in this patient group, I think you all know the risks of what the natural course of a disease poses. And I would say the risks of the vaccine are minimal. So we haven't really seen a database that keeps full track of these risks. We've sort of anecdotally collected information. When patients come to see me in a clinic, I ask them, have you had the vaccine? And uh, in none of the inborn errors of metabolism and lysosomal diseases that I see in clinic has anyone had a complication from the vaccine. So that includes Pompeii patients. So um, now the pediatric situation, yes, there have been studies and the studies have not shown a higher complication rate than adults. I think the big debate in the pediatric patients is whether or not they should get vaccinated because their complication rate is low. But there have been complications from COVID uh, in, in children. And, um, and, and so it's not a non-existent disease. It's just that most children seem to handle it. And those of you ha who have children in school, like I do, know, I think we had four school closures because of childhood cases in one school. So, um, so I think... In, in Alberta right now, you, a child can get the vaccine as long as they're 12 years of age and older. And in a household, such as the story you showed earlier, 
where any one person can bring a vaccine in, especially if you have another child and then you have a child with Pompeii disease, there is a risk of exposure. And so uh, just with all the debate in mind, uh, I think right now it's not mandatory to uh, vaccinate children, but I'm not sure how long we can avoid that either. Uh, so, so I don't have a problem with vaccinating children. Uh, I think um, one can't say for individual purposes need to vaccinate it. But one thing we've learned in the pandemic is it's sometimes not always about us. It's about our uh, fellow beings around us. And that's what, what actually most of the precautions were about because 90% of the population was fine. But it's about the few percent that could impact others. I'll run out of time if I keep answering questions at that length. So I, I hope that answers it somewhat. Thank you. And Sherry, you also had a follow-up question that I'll get you to ask as well. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, relative to the general public, any particular tips you have for managing our household bubbles? Um, a term I hope to never hear again. Oops, sorry. That, that is a sign my desktop has come to life. Okay. That's exciting. 20 minutes. <laughs> Let's give you a moment here. Let's see if there it's go. uh, too good to be true. We okay. We at least have video now. Okay. So could you repeat the question, please? I'd be happy to. Lovely to see you. Um, the question was with respect to household bubbles. Um, yeah. Relative to the general public, do you have any tips or tricks at, as far as managing our household bubbles and how we should do that comparative to the rest of the general population? Right, so there's no data to suggest it needs to be different than the general population. I think we have to remember in each bubble, once you expand the bubble, you're going to have different vulnerable, vulnerable groups, whether they are elderly patients, uh, grandparents, or things like uh, situations like that, or whether you have people with a rare disease. So there will need to be some customization. I think in general, what we're seeing for things like travel and other things like that is people that are fully vaccinated do represent the lowest risk. And um, now if you have symptoms of a viral illness, but you're still vaccinated, you still need to carry on with the precautions. But from what we're seeing in hospitals and complications, uh, it's the folks that are unvaccinated by and large that are having the complications. So, um, so I think uh, that's sort of a general guidance there. And I think most people who are in a family with a rare disease will probably be slower to expand the bubble. I, th I think if you look at this in some ways from a very, I hate to use the word common sense because it doesn't really apply, but the general sense approach, right? So you, you have a huge population with the virus you, you vaccination was the key to bringing this down and the control measures were there to prevent wide spreading during while while the vaccine took its effect and so now we have a portion of the population that's vaccinated it's still not the majority who are fully vaccinated and we have a proportion of the population that is unvaccinated so there's still a significant risk so if we were to this, this is one of those viruses where if you could uh, vaccinate everybody and then suppress the spread, you would think you would you could get rid of it. And so that's why we're not quite out of the woods because if we expand the bubble fully as if it's all taken care of, we will see a resurgence. And, and what we're seeing from testing is that these new variants replace the old variants. And, and the way viruses work is as they evolve, they tend not to get deadlier they tend to get less deadly, but spread more because that promotes their propagation in the environment. So, so in many ways, if you look at this virus, like many other viruses, it's actually not out to kill you. It's out to turn you into a reservoir to spread itself to other people. And so it will continue to do that. Uh, and now the Delta variant um, is the one that seems to be replacing some of the B117 from uh, South Asia. And we've seen that all along, that the new variants replace things. So their risk is there. And I would still be a little cautious and follow your public health guidelines at a minimum before expanding the bubble. 
and then just consider what you're expanding it to. So if you're going, uh, I remember one time uh, somebody asked me to meet them in a restaurant and it was during one of those partial lifting phases. And I said, I reluctantly said, okay, but when I went into the restaurant, it was packed. So people were thinking, oh, the restrictions are lifted and we can go just full blast. And that's what's gonna lead us into trouble. I think some of those precautions still need to be in place. So if you don't need to do that stuff, have super big birthday parties, have super big weddings or things like that, just take it into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lachlan, I'm gonna ask that you pose our next question, please. Sure. Um, hi, Dr. Khan. Um, do you think COVID is uh, here to stay? And uh, are we going to be looking at like annual shots like you would get for the flu, that kind of deal? Well, one thing that's interesting with this virus is we know with the flu virus, it has the seasonal cycle. So we know it has to mutate. And then it usually starts in the eastern part of the world and then eventually on its way to North America we have a little bit of leeway with which we make vaccines. This thing is not requiring that cycle. It's, it's, it's propagating on its own and resurging on its own without going through that because we haven't gotten rid of it. It doesn't really have a season. So uh, it's behaving differently. I do think it will take a little longer with vaccinations and adapting the vaccinations to new variants and, and perhaps people getting vaccinated more than once to deal with this issue. Um, probably what will happen over time is there will be pressure on the virus to mutate to a less deadly form where people, like many other coronaviruses, people may not uh, care too much about it over the long run. But so I don't think it's going to disappear. I think, but you know, what I say to people, uh, I, I remember in the, when the US president got infected and you, you sort of think the, the if you had to get uh, something bad, like, I don't know, uh, it shouldn't be saying this. If, if you had to get past security to get to that person, you couldn't, you'd be stopped by, you know what? But a 30 kilo base piece of RNA made it around the world on its own, right? That's, that's how powerful this, this thing really is. So, um, so I don't want to underestimate it. I think it will be around in one way, shape or form for a long time. It's, it's a new virus basically that's going to be part of the viruses that we deal with and we'll have recurrent vaccinations. But this and other viruses are going to be around. I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, what did we have last time? We, there was this new bird flu that people are talking about that's just emerged. Um, and uh, there was, uh, I'm blanking out on the name, H1N1, that came around. There was uh, a Zika virus. So this is just this is just part of biology. If you start counting all these viruses, there's a lot of stuff in recent history that came around. I mean, everybody was afraid of Zika for a while because, especially if it, if it was affecting pregnant women. And uh, even up here, I know they were testing for it. And I said, well, there's no Zika in Canada. That's not a differential here. But they wanted to start testing for it. Um, then uh, the other question I had, uh, have we, is there anything that we've learned, anything new that we've learned through this whole pandemic experience that we should, uh, that we should keep from a public health perspective in order to mitigate risk in the future? Sure. From public health, we have learned a lot, a lot. From virology, I doubt we've learned anything that we really didn't know before. There, there's nothing new in the science of coronavirus, really nothing that, that, when I think back at my basic virology, that's, that's anything new. So one thing we've learned is if you're sick, just stay home. Don't expose yourself to people, right? And that wasn't really part of our society. We kind of had a little bit of that stiff upper lip. If you're sick, just suck it up, go to work. And that would bother me a lot because, you know, as, as, as a medical doctor, I'm like, well, how the heck do you think the flu and this other stuff spreads? You're coughing, sneezing, touching surfaces. How long that will last in our societal memory, I don't know. I don't know that it will last very long, actually. The other thing we've learned is the importance of hand washing. 
which is the single one of the single most important things that an individual can do other than reduce exposure uh, to minimize the risk of transmittance. Um, and then we will have learned uh, how to jump back into our bubbles and, and maybe we've learned the importance of vaccines. Uh, so I think uh, those are some of the basic lessons from the public health perspective we've learned. I think one of the things as, as a society, and I'm speaking as a member of society, that was difficult is taking instructions from somebody, which would be your medical officer. Felt we tend not to do that. We don't like being told what to do. And then when we have one person tell the entire province what to do and tell you, you need to wear a mask and tell you exactly where you can go and how many people need to be at your party. We don't like that stuff. Uh, and hopefully it will end soon, but, uh, I, I wonder what all that effect it's had on people's psyche, uh, you know, sort of the, how we deal with uh, authority and things like that. And I can't predict what that's going to do, but so there's going to be other effects other than this whole infectious disease aspect that has affected us as, as people. It will be certainly interesting to see how those kind of things pan out. Yeah. So when we spoke a year ago, you spoke really well of the mRNA vaccines. Now, do you still feel the same about those? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the data are coming out um, that show how safe they actually are. And, um, you know, and, and so different ways of looking at this, sort of the mantra I've been making for this fun of it is they're not vaccines, they're gene therapy. Because that's because a traditional vaccine is putting a protein, exposing your body to a protein, and you make an antibody to the protein. The mRNA vaccines do not stimulate your body to react to any protein. They give your body the instructions on how to make the protein. That's that's the basis of any genetic disease, is you have a nucleic acid instruction to make a protein. So it's basically teaching your body how to make the antibody, but it's not using the body's mechanism to generate an antibody to an antigen to do it. So some people have argued it isn't gene therapy, but that's the, to me, that's the, the construct of gene therapy is you give the genetic instruction. The genetic instruction here is RNA. And as, and as you've said before, Lachlan, this technology was being used initially uh, under development to treat genetic diseases. In fact, in the United States, not yet in Canada, although studies were done in Canada as well, it's used to treat uh, amyloidosis, a uh, genetic form of amyloidosis, TTR amyloidosis. And so it, that's an approved, FDA approved therapy. And we know for many small molecule diseases, uh, you know, things like methylmalonic acidemia, phenylketonuria, this has the potential to work quite well actually. And for Pompeii disease, I think it also has potential because I think Pompeii disease will actually be very challenging to treat with traditional gene therapies. Because the traditional gene therapies, which whether they're adeno-associated vector, AAV vectors, none of those target the muscle. They target everything. Sometimes they target the liver more than anything else, but they don't target the muscle. They just happen to be around and get into muscle. And uh, what people have done is they've put promoters there, uh, sort of a Trojan horse, so that if it's in the muscle, then the, the vector develops more of the protein compared to the liver, but the targeting is not there. And the issue with targeting is you have muscle in how many places? Your total mass of muscle is bigger than your mass of liver. So if you're treating a urea cycle disease, you need a certain amount of particles to treat the liver. But when you're treating a neuromuscular disease, you have to give a lot more. And when you do that, you up the toxicity. And I also think something like a urea cycle disorder, you could treat with a one injection of an AAV vector. And we've been in those trials and, and, and you know, those, there have been news stories around that and it can work. It can work in one shot. I don't think it's going to work with neuro neuromuscular diseases. My, my concept with neuromuscular diseases is, is you have to have many 
small applications to nudge the disease across. You can't slam it across because if you slam it across, you will run into toxicity, which means a huge vector dose or trying to cure it all in one shot. I think that's where the mRNA treatments have potential. And I don't know that there's any being developed for Pompeii disease, but I'm always telling everybody to do it. So, so that because you're not going to develop antibodies to the mRNA nanoparticle, you can dose it again and again. So you give one dose, nudge it along, see how far you get. You give another dose, nudge it along until you see the desired effect. And that's one big advantage of these compared to the AAB vectors. Or um, for infantile Pompe disease, I actually think the transplant method, the ex vivo gene therapy will work uh, perhaps better. Because if you give a single dose of an AAB vector to an infantile Pompe, that's the one dose they have for their life. So most infants double their weight in six months. So by six months, you have half the effective dose. And then it, it just keeps getting diluted. So what you would do is convert an infantile Pompe to a late onset Pompe. That's what you'd end up doing. So, but if you took uh, what we did with Fabry and Gaucher is you, you took stem cells and you put the vector in the stem cells. Now when the stem cell replicates, it replicates the protein, the uh, DNA as well. So if you did that with an infant, then the infant would presumably have a lifetime supply of the corrected protein. So now that's hitting with a sledgehammer, but that's what you do sometimes in medicine. You do need to use a sledgehammer when that's all that's going to work. Uh, so I, I think these applications will be across the board the same thing. I think people need to consider what they understand about the disease, what they understand about the different therapies, and in what disease, what therapy is going to work. That's really fascinating. The differentiation is really interesting. I feel like you could do a really good episode of the Magic School Bus on that, you know, <laughs> really break it down with some good visuals. <laughs> So my next question for you is that Canada seems to have been a leader in focusing on getting as many first vaccines as possible. Can you kind of expand and explain this strategy? Well, I think the best way for us to deal with this epidemic actually is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I mean, these gains that we've seen here have been because of vaccination. And now you'll see with public health, they are targeting vaccination benchmarks as they try to uh, downscale the pandemic response. So um, in Canada, we don't make our own vaccine. That's, that's a tragedy in itself, which we can leave to another day, but we do not have a biotech sector that makes our own vaccine. So we've relied on the goodwill of others to give us the vaccine. And so I think some of that strategy has been, what if somebody decides not to share it with us? And so you, you want to have enough around that uh, you won't run short. So I think uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we've, we have had to rely on others to give us the vaccine, but I do agree with the strategy to try to vaccinate as many people and have it available to as many people as possible. And in many ways, the American system resembled the Canadian system for a while because you didn't have to pay for your vaccine. You got it free, just like you did here. Many Canadians got it free here too. So that's, that's another interesting observation is around the world, they kind of uh, use the, the uh, sort of public health Canadian style or in many other countries like you know, in, in Great Britain and, and, and many places in Europe, that style of medicine to get the distribution. Definitely interesting about the distribution. And I've been told that we have some questions from the audience. So I'm going to pass this over to Hamira. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, thanks again, Dr. Khan. These are excellent responses to questions. And while they um, are specific to Pompeii disease, they certainly apply to other neuromuscular conditions, metabolic conditions as well, rare diseases as Sherry uh, stated earlier. Um, the question that came in was around third 
doses. As many Canadians are getting their second doses, and that is ramping up, there was a small study that was published this past Monday showing that those who are immunocompromised would benefit from a third dose of an mRNA, Moderna, or Pfizer vaccine. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think we're going to get these emerging niches of information in special subgroups as time comes along, and we basically have to follow the science and the, and the results that come from there. We know, for example, when you look at the measles vaccine, a long time ago, the measles vaccine, there was one dose, right? And, and uh, some years ago, more than 20 years ago, it was recognized that you need a booster dose, right? And if we put somebody through a bone transplant, bone marrow transplant, they get revaccinated again with everything. So, so when there is a risk of immunity uh, decreasing, then the best way to deal with that is to repeat exposure. Um, you see the same. So, so if you look at immune compromised people, um, then their vaccination approach can be a little different than people who aren't. And there's no reason to suspect this would be any different really. We have a challenge in the chat here. Uh, it says here from Ryan, would like to challenge Dr. Khan to clarify that Pompe is not a neuromuscular disease. I'm not sure I said that. It actually is a neuromuscular disease. So the, maybe that was just something that didn't come across properly, uh, but it is a neuromuscular disease. It says you said it was, but it is not. Well, I will challenge you to uh, clarify why it is not. It affects the muscle and you get storage in the nerve cells as well. And that's been demonstrated. You get neuropathy. So that's neuro and muscular. So is there another definition you have for what neuromuscular means? I have another question here too, um, as Ryan might be responding to that challenge, um, which is great. We love spirited debates. The next question is something that I think Sherry alluded to earlier is, do you think this sort of, we were able to quickly approve, we as in Health Canada was able to quickly approve um, vaccines. And we know that the drug regulatory approval process can you know, span many years, months. Do you think the sets precedents for bringing in new innovative timely therapies um, for rare diseases? Do you think we can use this as a case for advocacy around really kind of optimizing the approval process, catheter reviews, and NAS, and then reimbursement? I would hope it would, but I don't know that it will. The, the mechanisms used to bring this in I don't know that any of them are gonna get applied to rare diseases. Uh, we saw exceptional approvals. We saw changes in dose frequency, mixing of doses, all that stuff made up by politicians in many cases. Um, and I think they're gonna revert back to the burden for rare diseases is trying to prove a level of proof which some of this other stuff never really had to, right? Um, so, um, which is a tragedy because uh, people with rare diseases, they don't have much of a choice. In some cases, the disease is going to end their life and they can't wait for an experiment. I think that's part of the dialogue we have to change. This concept that you need a placebo controlled randomized trial comes from old fashioned internal medicine. The three people on the planet with some disease, you don't run a randomized placebo controlled trial. You find other ways to determine whether you're making a difference. And I think there are ways to make a difference and there are ways to determine this and we need to abandon that pathway. Now, one thing that has emerged independently of many of this uh, is that um, Health Canada now has this N of one trial mechanism in place where you can do research and bring in drugs on rare diseases. The burden of proof is kind of still the same though. It's, um, you know, it's like if you had to evacuate one person of an island on an island and I said, sure, you can evacuate them. Uh, what color is your 737 going to be? And you're going to say, 737, you had one person. And I'll say, no, but the rules say you need a 737 to evacuate everybody from the island. So you can't bring a small Cessna. You need to bring a big plane. 
So that, some of that concept is still there in that they say, well, the drug manufacturer has to do this and, and the doctor has to do this. And doctors aren't drug manufacturers. Well, most of them. And so if you're trying to do an end of one trial and you still have to produce that same volume of data, how on earth are you going to come up with it? So it's like they, they sort of give way to one solution and, and they block it with something else. Super interesting. And, and so I have Ryan, to... Ryan and I might have to go at this separately, but happy to do it, Ryan. So I have another That's still about the definition of a neuromuscular. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some communities have high vaccine hesitancy. How much risk does that pose to the general community? Well, okay, so when we come down to sort of basic things in life. Let's take the most basic, which is physics, right? A car crash. Two, two cars are gonna collide. They don't care if somebody is crying inside one of them, if somebody has a rare disease or somebody has what. So when we look at trying to get most of the population protected, that means most of the population vaccinated. So, um, so, the hesitancy is, I, I don't see a scientific basis for it. Yes, there are personal feelings around it and personal beliefs, but there's no science behind it. There just isn't. Uh, yes, you can have doubt and, and nothing I say is gonna eliminate doubt in people's minds, but the science behind an infectious agent that responds to vaccination is that you vaccinate. Arguing, the virus does not have ears and it doesn't care what we're arguing. What it, all it cares about is, is the body going to make an immune response and fight it. That's all it cares about. Otherwise it's gonna spread. It really doesn't care about our philosophy. So I think we need to talk to people though. We don't want to antagonize them. We wanna to talk to people because at the end of the day, we are humans, we're people and we, we wanna work with each other. But, um, but I, I don't, I've seen it on LinkedIn and uh, uh, Facebook and stuff like that. They are collective bits of information. That, that's not how we look at science when we review something. If we're gonna say the vaccines don't work, then why don't we say none of these treatments for Pompe disease are gonna work either. And we can believe that we can, we can do something else. I think one, example that came out was reflexology. So uh, no, uh, no disrespect to the reflexologist, but that's not gonna cure uh, lysosomal storage disease and nor will it cure an infectious disease either. So we, we have to try to still use, we are where we are. This vaccine is a product of human ingenuity and science. It's not a product of uh, a belief or a system, something like that. It is a scientific, uh, response. Um, I much appreciated, you know, discussing the concerns that people have. Um, and I know one of the things that's recently been announced is Dr. Fauci in the States has announced that they're going to start doing clinical trials on young children so that they can hopefully start vaccinating by the age of two. Um, and you touched earlier on the fact that you think we are going to need to vaccinate children in order to keep our society at large much safer. Are you familiar with any plans on Canada to follow suit or will we, just, will we be planning to borrow their research in order to make our own informed decisions? Well, that's what we do most of the time. We borrow other people's research. <laughs> because I, I know when these, when, when, when they were reviewing these with Health Canada, I would sit there and scratch my head and I said, so Health Canada is reviewing the data that the FDA looked at from the Pfizer trials. And we had no Pfizer trials in Canada. And yet they're saying, we're the experts that are gonna review it, but you never did the trial. How can you be the expert? You're the reading of the paper. So, so I don't know if, if we will involve children in those trials, we, 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 we don't you know there, there, since then, there have been manufacturers in Canada that are trying to make the virus, uh, the, the um, uh, mRNA vaccine, and they may be conducting trials. I don't know if they're conducting in children, but um, I don't know, going back to what Lockman was saying, 
this thing might become something, I mean, it, it might be after, you know, the sandcastle has been washed by the wave and you're like, oh, what shape was it in? Uh, so um, we're going into summer where we don't have people going into classrooms. So what will be the infectivity rate in small children? Um, it is quite possible that this will disappear if it gets to a certain point. That's a possibility too. And then, then you might say, so if you sort of looked at it then and said your risk of getting an infection or a two-year-old child transmitting it is so low, why would you even do a trial in those kids? So I, I think we're going to have to ask those questions. Certainly in preschoolers, um, why would we vaccinate them? if they're not going to be a source of infection. Now we do, with things like the flu, we do vaccinate them, right? Because we say, oh, you've got a sibling that has, let's say is immunocompromised, has leukemia or something, vaccinate everybody in your family. So I think, I, I don't know how much of that will be hard data and how much we'll be sort of trying to snake our way through arguments. Alexandra, I know we're at time, we're a minute to go, but um, perhaps uh, one of the last questions for you, Dr. Khan, is as you're reflecting on the clinical care you provide and the patients you serve, and whether they have Pompeii or other neuromuscular conditions, what would you say is the number one lesson you've learned from the pandemic? Oh, well, I'm going to be a little bold and provocative here. I think the big thing we've learned is to decentralize care. For these rare diseases, in a lot of places, care is centralized, right? So you're traveling three hours or two hours to go to some hospital clinic somewhere. Well, you live in your community. Why can't you get access to care in your community? Why do you have to spend an entire day going for a one hour appointment? So that's been part of our philosophy for a long time. So with one exception, and that's because I had no choice in that particular case, every one of our patients is on home infusion or in a clinic outside the hospital. And we had zero interruptions during COVID. It didn't do anything because we, it, it was kind of going along with that philosophy for people to have care in a more easy manner. So I think that's one thing we've learned. I think we've also learned that not only for things like enzyme infusions, but appointments and things, why do you need to go to all that trouble to get a renewal on some inhaler? Like it's, it's for a long time, that's been ridiculous. Cause I'm like, you know, I'd see people in clinic, they're like, oh yeah, I, I need you to sign this form to do this. And I'm like, you gotta be joking me. Uh, so like, why, why do we do it like this? And that's because when you get a, an appointment booking, nobody really asks, why are you coming in? They're like, oh, you need to see Dr. Khan. Let's face it, most of the visits you make with the physician, I don't do anything. I listen to the story, I write a note. So what we're trying to do is figure out what is it likely I'm gonna do something? When is it likely the physical exam is gonna be meaningful? Uh, if somebody says, oh, I've got a discharge from my ear or a swelling in my ankle, I need a physical exam. There's no question about it. Somebody with Pompe disease who I've been managing for 10 years says, I feel fine, I have nothing wrong with, you know, why do I need to come at the three month interval? Why can't I see you a little later? I mean, isn't that how they came to see me in the first place? They figured out they had an issue and they said, I have a health issue, I need you to look. So, and, and people in the rare disease community, they're, they're very sophisticated. They don't, um, if they have a problem, they will contact their doctors. So. I think we learned to do this remote stu stuff and, and not justify a physical visit and, and $20 or $25 parking in a hospital parking lot just to get a prescription renewal. I mean, this is just, I hope we've learned from that. I, I don't know where, some, some of it is still going on, but I think we're trying, I'm trying heavily to triage patients to figure out what is the intent of the visit? What do I expect to accomplish? and what's the best way to give you that care rather than just default to coming in. That's an excellent lesson. Thank you so much. Over to you, Alex. 
I would say that a lot of us, especially those who make the frequent uh, hospital trips with the parking payments, are very appreciative of that kind of mindset. Or those um, so, of us who live in the middle of nowhere and have to fly to another city and miss three days of work in order to do a checkup every six months. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. So on behalf of the Canadian Association for Pompeii Disease, I want to thank all of our panelists, Muscular Dystrophy Canada, and especially you, Dr. Khan, for being with us. Thank you to all of those who decided to tune in. Um, I hope that it was informative, that everyone learned something. Thank you to those who shared their experience. And hopefully we will uh, be back to normal sometime soon. And I think Elaine had something to do too. I don't know if that finished it today, but uh, um, if you guys know about it. Yeah, I'm not Elaine, sure if we have time for that. Okay. I know, the, I know the, everyone's probably sure. rushing to get dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would, I just, I'm sorry if I used up all your time. No, no worries though. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for being here. And I believe with that, it is good night.